Okay, so we are recording and we're doing the Q&A from your Wednesday, the... Okay. Hello, everybody. Wednesday the 9th. Yes. Hello, everybody. Should we start? <laughs> yes. Hello, Freya, too. <laughs> Hello, Josh. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the first question we've got is from Alan Kendall, and he says, what was your process when you were asked to make the covers for Psygnosis games? Um, were you approached with a brief and a vision, or were you afforded artistic license to create what you wanted? Well, the guys who were inventing the games, remember this was a long time ago, it was 1985, 86 when they first approached me, talked about their games as being interactive movies, which people who are familiar with games today will understand that's a fair description. But back then they were pretty much matchstick men. <laughs> and the characters looked like matchstick men. So although they had a story and a game, um, I, I had effectively a great deal of freedom because there was no real visual reference. I remember, I think, only recently or relatively recently seeing what those games actually look like, having known the artwork for things like Shadow of the Beast and that sort of thing. And think it reminded me of that like sea monkey issue that everyone had where they thought they'd pour this powder in a cup and have a little marine world. And it was just some wiggly dots in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not that it was that, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that bad, but I just yeah. wondered like, if you bought like the Shadow of the Beast box, I, I, I wasn't there. So I wonder how much of what that looked like people expected to see when they played the game and hopefully you weren't too disappointed. <laughs> Increasingly better. Yeah, I saw like recently, they did they redo it or something recently? It looked amazing, it looked like your pictures. Yeah, so it started very simple, but an interesting game, and then Shadow of the Beast 2, and then Shadow of the Beast 3. Each one incrementally more visually convincing. What other games did you do for Psygnosis? images for? Um, gosh, Radicus, Aquaventura, um, Barbarian, there was a lot. Hmm. Did any of them have more recent incarnations? I don't know, I don't know. Um, I was as excited about doing the Cygnosis logo and the owl as I was about the, um, the games. Um, they were very iconic for their time. And I think there is a whole nostalgia industry going on with them. Yeah, I mean, like when I meet people sort of closer to your age, if they know you, they know you from the music and the album covers. But when I meet people my age who know you, it's always because of those games. And they get right. amazingly excited about it. I mean, I don't know that I would have heard of them necessarily, even if I was kind of growing up playing games that much. But for some reason, yeah, they were very, very popular. Mm. And I never knew. They were, yeah. 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 And I remember, but even like Lemmings, I definitely played Lemmings when I was younger. And that was, that, that was a Cygnosis game, right? It was a Cygnosis game that I didn't work on. One of the very few that I didn't actually have anything to do with. No, but and I remember the OWL logo on it. Yes, the Lemmings was definitely one of the few games that were also for girls and boys. So Shadow of the Beast, Barbarian, are these all boy games? Yes. They may deny it, but it's... Tetris apparently was, sales were about equal. 
literally equal 50 50 male and female hmm i mean that's interesting isn't it because i think like a lot of people have tried to argue that there's some sort of biological determinism involved with gaming where boys like systemizing and logic based things so they like gaming more but tetris is literally just you know spatial systematizing with bricks so that would suggest that's not what it is it would suggest what it is is boys like killing people more <laughs> that seems to be where the disparity comes in with games like grand theft Auto show or metal gear solid and all of those kind of things i don't know i'm just naming some that i remember <laughs> my friends at university playing but yeah i can't really get around the fact that boys do seem to like violent games more I heard that they are very good for spatial awareness though, like if you're doing tests of it, you know those sort of IQ tests where you, you have to move a 3D object in your mind. Um, they did, it was one of those tests, I think it was that one in particular, where apart from any other, there is a gender disparity in doing that test. But what they found was if they got the group of people testing for that to all play a video game for 10 minutes, then the gender gap closed. So they think that with that kind of 3D spatial awareness thing, if there's a gap where there's a gap, it's because of gaming. Yeah. Hank used to be, have a very strong moral view. That he, he didn't want to have games that were full of blood and violence. And so when we were doing, um, and there came a point when he wanted a partner and I was doing the presentations in England, seeing different companies, we managed to raise quite a lot of money to finish the game. Although it, to this date, it's still not finished, but we were talking to game um, publishers and I started to explain Hank's philosophy. And I said, this game, does not have a lot of blood and gore and violence. And the guy said, oh, don't worry, we can fix that. <laughs> so. hmm. I mean, it uh, is, yeah. And it was, that was a game that by the time we started that, what you saw on the screen was getting very much closer what was being drawn and that was a game where i spent a lot of time working with michael kaluta michael did all the characters and they did look very cool on the game on the on the screen also because um we did we were pioneering a lot of motion capture you're talking about onyx yeah we we're pioneering a lot of motion capture for that project so yeah, it's, it looked very convincing. I wonder why more games like that aren't made. Like I remember at university, one game that was really popular was Bioshock. And yeah. that was incredible to watch. I would watch my friends play because it was like watching an incredible movie. Uh, that went on for hours and hours and hours and hours. But it, it was really compelling, even if you weren't playing the game. And I couldn't play the game because it just made me t too anxious. Um, yeah. And then after the first one, Underwater, there was one in the sky that was absolutely incredible to look at. And I just sort of wondered, why, why don't more games go for something sort of really extraordinary worldwide and not, you know, a bit more story, a bit you know less killing i suppose that's very gender normative of me to say that would have described onyx very well mm. um one of the things that's weird is that all games which require a degree of physical reaction even tetris do pump a lot more adrenaline into your system <clears throat> so if you do a lot of game playing you are very prone to things like, um, I don't know, panic attacks and stuff, because you're not exercising, you're not burning off the adrenaline, but you are generating it. So even if it's not blood and violence, even if it's something very gentle, as long as it requires very quick 
physical reactions, it does do pump up adrenaline. And, so what and you a, need is gaming rooms that are like being in those, have you, have you ever seen, is it absorbing? where you get in this big inflatable ball and run around. You need VR games where you're doing them inside a Zorb. <laughs> well, there, might, there needs to be a way of exercising physical. You need to burn off the adrenaline. And the best way to do that is physical exercise. So, you know, the idea of sitting in front of a screen for hours is not ultimately a good thing long term it's like that thing isn't it i remember reading somewhere you know when you're like playing with a cat with a bit of string and then all of a sudden it will just shoot off and apparently that's because all of that playing like builds up its adrenaline and gets it all hunty and it can't kind of contain it anymore and it has to just burn it off and that's why it sort of and that, that's how I feel playing video games. It's like I, I can do maybe five, ten minutes and then, and then I just have to drop it because I can't be involved anymore. It's too much. I can't cope. <laughs> well, we're going to get, we're going to have to learn all these things, the social yeah. and physical consequences. Yeah, although like there are things about games that I always did really like. <laughs> Excuse me. Ooh. Like, do you remember one of the, Zelda? I loved Zelda, but I loved it for just riding around on the horse. <laughs> and I would have liked to have had something in between just riding around on the horse and then doing these really scary games. Something in between would have been really nice for me. Hmm. Can you remember me working on those games? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the paintings of the places and that like um, the magician's hut that looked like a sort of mummified mammoth on sticks. And, and yes, I, I really like that. And I remember Michael Kaluta's characters. Um, and I remember obviously the one that was called Freya, who was like a little, a little child Valkyrie. And I love <laughs> that. Well, that's, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you remembered that. Yeah. Hmm. We were talking yesterday about Michael Kaluta because last time I got asked a question by him and I was saying how I just showed the book last time but when you and I were talking I was saying that he he has an incredible instinct for the words when he's just talking about how he draws and um, I was saying he is like a kind of Zen artist. He talks about drawings where he's got a brief and then in the middle of these doodles, which are clearly to do with his brief, is another figure. And I remember in one occasion it was a girl pointing at one of the other drawings and he said, well, that just fell out of the pencil. And it's a great way of describing how if you're in the flow and you're doing it, you will generate stuff that will surprise you. But also, if you're so good that you can just have things happen without checking the reference and doing the measurements and checking the perspective and the proportions and da, 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 da. if it can just, I mean, you have to be really good, don't you, for, some, for a good drawing to just fall out of the pencil, I think. And he is. He, he is exceptional. I think if people are interested in drawing, there's a lot of good books I sent you. A list, but I would say Michael Kaluta's sketchbooks are brilliant. Yeah. The work, as well as for the drawings. Yeah, I think it was like a few years ago I did these sort of symmetrical pen and ink characters um, and I put them up, and just as I was putting them up, something of that ilk came up on Michael's page, and I just thought, why am I bothering? Because ah. you have I'll a get there. <laughs> take to him. Huh? You have a different take to him. You could learn a lot from him, but he could learn a lot from you. So I wouldn't worry. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm not fishing. <laughs> so the next question that we have. 
um, is, do you ever encase your pictures totally in cabinets and why, why not? I'm not sure what that means. What do you think that means? <clears throat> Let's ask him. That's from William Will Baker. So we'll ask him about that. That's from Will Baker. Yeah. <laughs> Will, if you're watching, we need an answer. What on earth are you talking about? <laughs> um. Right, so he's got another one. Let's see if we can do better on this one. Weren't you looking at a project with David Lynch a few years ago? Cheers, Will. Yes, actually we were. Yes, he got approached by a Japanese company called Cosmic Utopia Limited. And I got approached by the same company. And it was a company that distributed Ghibli in Japan, or at least that's what we were told. Ghibli. Ghibli. And they wanted to develop a project which used both of our skills. They wanted us to work together on a project, but they didn't have a project in mind. So it was a kind of a first step. I spent a week in LA and quite a bunch of time at David Lynch's house. And we just talked, but we didn't talk about the project much because at the time we had no real idea what they had in mind. But it was great to meet him. He, he started as a furniture designer, or not started as, but he was a very good furniture designer as well as being a brilliant filmmaker. So I was disappointed nothing came of that because I really liked him and I really thought he was really fantastic filmmaker. Hmm. Furniture yeah. maker. And I'm a huge, huge Twin Peaks fan, just to put that out there. Yes, Twin Peaks was, was a big success in Japan. That's what triggered it. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That mm. sort of surprises me. Why? I guess because it's sort of quite dark. And there's long periods of time where nothing in particular happens and strangely. <laughs> and I just, I don't know, I suppose often the things that are popular over here seem a little bit more bombastic. Well, it, it did remind me of um, um, Bruce Pennington did a book called Escartus. <clears throat> And although his contract was to do an entirely different book, somehow he got to doing the translations of Nostradamus, not of his predictions of what would be happening today, but what would be happening 3,000 years in the future. And Bruce translated it from medieval French without being able to speak a word of French. So he did word by word by word with a modern English French dictionary. And it made no sense, but it was like, what can I say? It made no sense, but it was like a kind of psychedelic Tao. You, know, you were kind of expecting it to make sense. It was in couplets, it was in verse. And I remember when we published it and we, we because there wasn't a huge amount, we put quite large text. 24 point or something, I'm guessing, I can't remember now. But I remember a year after we did a contract with the Japanese publishers, we met them at Frankfurt Book Fair and they still hadn't got the book out. And, and I, I was saying to them, what on earth's going on? You know, you've been sitting on this for years. Why isn't it out? And they said, well, we, we're having trouble with the translation. It makes no sense in Japanese. It makes no sense in English. Get on with it. <laughs> Print it back. <laughs> it did. But it looked like it should. 
actually I found out the other day um, so my company have a restaurant in Paris that's a sort of it's a Japanese rest restaurant in Paris and the logo was designed by David Lynch and I was oh, yeah. yeah and I was so upset no one told me and then I thought why would they why would they have thought necessarily <laughs> why didn't anyone introduce us even though it's nothing to do with me but I did get really excited about that what wasn't your company going to do? Where did we go in um, East Germany? Was it Potsdam? Potsdam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't your company have its eyes on a building in Potsdam? Yes. So that's all up and running now, Japan House in Potsdam. Mm -hmm. And they do sort of various Japanese themed events and exhibitions there and rent out apartments above that are all kind of designed by a Japanese architect and very, very cool and <laughs> out of my price range. <laughs> but yeah, that was a surprise. So yeah, oh, that's such a shame that nothing kind of happened. What an amazing kind of opportunity to mix those people together. I thought so. I thought it was sounded like a really great idea and to be fair David Lynch thought it was a great idea um, and he was really kind about it so for me it was it was great the potential was great but as I say yeah nothing happened the did I mention the name of the company Cosmic Cos Utopia yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe one day um to be honest that name sounded like something that would have been sold in the late 60s in a little bottle <laughs> uh, okay next question hi roger freyer do you imagine yourselves walking around within the specific landscapes you create and imagine that was also from Will. But I like that question. Well, tell me what your reaction to it is. I think it happens while you're working on it, doesn't it? Like you can't avoid it. Um, yeah. When I was, uh, I was doing a painting the other day and um, I guess because you need certain different angles for reference and just the process of putting it together makes it, I think, as real in your head as looking out the window at a landscape that's out, you know, actually there, which is a really, you know, I think a good point in terms of being careful with what you paint because <laughs> you're going to be spending that psychological time in that space at least as long as you paint it and if you ever look at it because it takes you there again you know the ins and outs and alcoves and alleyways and so whenever you look at it I feel like you go back there don't you yes I, I was going to say two things when I'm designing a building I have to imagine every nook and cranny how I will go around it how it will be experienced and I learned that I do that very much so with the landscapes. Um, I was asked to do another view of a landscape I'd already done. And I sat down thinking, okay, I'm going to have to work this out. And I did what I normally do. Instead of working it out, I put on a story, I started listening, and I found I knew exactly what it looked like if I turned around turn around I knew I didn't have to work it out it was very accessible information and it just it just flowed so I would say whereas with the architecture I really want to build it and I really really want to walk around it um, with regard to the um, landscapes I'd like to do that to a large degree as well. I'd like to landscape the architecture. But the other option is VR. So I would like to look at that too. I'd like to look at taking those landscapes into a virtual world. 
and yeah so painting is good i mean some painting can take many hours i i think i did three or four hundred hours on the layer and you do even if it's only 25 i've never done a complicated painting in 25 hours but yeah that's a lot of time to invest into exploring and going into a space we had a paint i'm worried you're going to say who did it and now i don't want to offend anyone so without saying who did it tell me after but we had a painting in the office that was like a really hideous la if la was a kind of garbage tip <laughs> painting <laughs> that was just rows and rows of trash um, maybe i'm remembering this wrong do you know the painting that i'm talking about this in, your in in beaconsfield villas when we were there it was in the office on the wall and it was like some sort of city dystopian futuristic cityscape but all that was in it was like trash and <laughs> <laughs> vehicles and streets of deserty rubbish. Am yes. I, do you know the one I'm talking about? The big one. Am I misremembering that? It's not one of yours, is it? <laughs> how, how big was it? Was it big? It was big. Hmm. I hated that painting. It made me feel like it made me feel like being somewhere kind of deathly and barren and mm. miserable and don't tell me who did it don't say it here but i want to know <laughs> it wasn't you was it was it you no, no. i'll tell you i'll tell you later but it was actually meant to look like that i think it was a painting not a valet but of a a lot of concrete structures where they test an atom bomb right i see but it was yeah it was that sunlight that's like dry and you know it'll make your throat sore if you spend time there and i was just thinking like if you're an artist and you're spending time in the place that you're making that would have been a grim effort mm. that's what i was thinking of there and i guess if that's what you do i i was thinking that and not that i think that his work is you know anything other than amazing because it is but um oh what's his name um the dutch artist who did the alien designs? Swiss. Huh? Tiger. Swiss. Yeah. Like his work is incredible, but he and incredibly detailed. He must have had to have spent a lot of time in some really dark places doing that work. And maybe you get used to it and maybe that's where you become comfortable. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting thought. I would have loved to have asked him. Maybe he's talked about that. But yeah, mm. that would have been a dark place to be for a really long time in some of his pictures, I guess. Not, well, that one of his pictures, but he did other pictures that were really beautiful. So when I tell you who it is and what he did, then you'll see he did. The ones that looked grim were rare. But he was good at grim as well as he was at beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah I mean that's the thing isn't it it's something I do think about like if you're an artist we can't all be painting pretty pictures of flowers and meadows um you know there's lots to say in different ways of saying it but definitely for me that's where I prefer to be <laughs> hmm. um your painting my love of quite spooky. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of the one I'm looking at right now. It's up on the bookshelves. Yeah, well, that's what I mean, actually, partly with the Geiger as well. Like, there are things that you find comfortable and nice that other people might not. Like, when I was doing the medical illustration, um, I often found what I was drawing and painting really beautiful. Um, and then when you show someone the drawing and explain to them what it is, some people would say, wow, that's beautiful, but often it would be, Ooh. and I understand why it's sort of, you know, it's a natural reaction. But for me, I just thought they were beautiful. It didn't make me feel badly. 
Um, so this question is from Stuart Kesting. Uh, how do you use your library? Do you go to it for inspiration? Yeah. That was an easy answer. In what way? Well, one of the things I find is that when you are connecting stuff in your head, the more you have in there, the more connections you can make. And most of my inspiration comes from walking in landscapes. But um, I did say that I discovered when I was um, a student, actually, and books were very expensive when I was a student. Well, certainly more than I could casually afford. And I would look at a book to see if it was worth investing more interest in it. And I discovered if I flick through so that there wasn't really time to take in an image, I would see things that weren't there. And sometimes I could see them in incredible detail and they simply weren't there. And that is, about, that is part of the process of how we see. We send relatively low grade image, not images, information to the brain and the brain constructs an image based on what it knows. A child has to learn to see. The child doesn't automatically see something. They, they have to learn to see. And adults can still see stuff that isn't there. And I found that's an interesting thing to do when I'm playing. I'm wondering for an idea. And you can sometimes trigger it. But the other thing I find is that if you've, if you've looked at 100,000 images, you're more likely to, you know, you're feeding the brain. It's, it's important. So I'm looking around bookshelves in here, and I do know that all, the, all my reading books are in another library, as you know. All the, nearly all the books in here are essentially visual. But they're not visual in necessarily a predictable sense. They're not necessarily picture books. They might be books that are very interesting physically in themselves without actually having to think of them as great illustrated books. You have an order to them as well, though, don't you? Ish, yeah. They're mm. sort of in themes. Can you explain that a bit? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I do. So it's something if I've got time, I love pulling out a dozen books and just looking through them. Um, and I do it all, I do it all the time. I, I find time all the time to look at one or two or 10 books. And I go through them again and again and again over time. But you have, you have them grouped in things like, you've got like a section of books about Egypt or uh, wildlife photography or Japanese gardens. Um, yes. That kind of yeah. thing. So do you find it helpful, like if you're, if you're thinking you need some visual reference, you'll go to a section rather than think of a specific book or? I do sometimes think of books for reference. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> the obvious thing would be if I was painting an owl, I would go for a book on owls and I have a book on parrots, but I'm much more likely, both of my major owl paintings, not painting the Cygnosis one, which is more stylized. I actually went and saw an owl. You were with me on one of those occasions. So we photographed this fabulous creature flying around as well as perched. And that is invariably more useful than a book. 
but sometimes they're not available. Do you know what? I was just thinking that must have been, not, you know, at most 10 years ago, something like that. And we were, and we took a load of cameras, actual cameras, and our phones would have taken better pictures now. I'm thinking of some of those pictures and thinking my iPhone could do a better job. Isn't that amazing how quickly that's changed? Yes, and you're, you're right about that. It could have taken a much better picture. Hang on a tick. I'm just going to... I'm going to look up the next questions here and say, um, as usual, if you guys are watching the live videos, if you put question for Friday, that's definitely going to get mentioned. These are... These are Japanese ledgers. Up a bit. And it's sort of bound together with strings. It's five. Yes, five individual ledger, ledgers bound together. And I don't look at that for reference. This is a Chinese book. And the illustrations in it are stunningly rough. And I'm told it's some kind of um, almanac, making predictions. Mm. <laughs> I've got, um, I, I love handmade books, handwritten books. I've got, I've got a, a log book from um, a, 1860s Navy ship. It's an unofficial logbook. Naval officers weren't allowed to keep diaries, but many did. And yeah, I have probably about 50 or 60 of those Japanese books of all different kinds, including ones that are poetry or a story. Even. But I find those inspirational, especially if I'm doing calligraphy or lettering. So they serve all kinds of purposes, but they are visual, visual inspiration. Anyway, what was your next question? Our next question is from Jonathan Phillips, one of our students. Hey, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> um, Jonathan said, have you listened to Ju the June audio book? The trailer came out today for the movie. Have I listened to the June audio book? I've read the book. I don't think I've listened to the audio book, no. So, something to check out. Because when I read the book, of course, it would have been 40 years ago, I guess. More, probably, 50 or something. 40 years ago, I would guess, when I read it. So, if it does exist as an audio book, which is interesting, I'll check it out. Thank you. Mm. Isn't that funny? Like the, you know, you and mum both loved that book and things like that and just didn't pass it on. Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I'm trying to think. Like I remember you trying. Oh, no, I'm going to alienate so many people if I say this. But I remember you trying me out on Star Wars and I just absolutely couldn't couldn't connect Not, at all. Oh, was that mum? One of you trying me out on that. And I remember mum watching Star Trek as well. And like, and every time she put it on, I just went, oh my God. And she put it on the other day when I was back in England as well. And actually I found it really relaxing and I was thinking about it and I was thinking, I couldn't understand why people, and maybe I haven't watched enough. I couldn't understand becoming obsessed with it but I could absolutely understand finding it just the most relaxing thing to watch because there's just nothing in it that gives you grief about normal life, is there? Like if you're watching television shows um, that are, you know, documentaries or dramas or whatever, you know, so much of them are like 
you know, about real places and contemporary issues and things that are happening that might be stressing you out and that you don't want to think about. But if you're watching Star Trek, all of the concerns, all of the concerns, sorry, can you hear me better now? Yeah, why? Did you have something on top of this microphone? Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> But with Star Trek, like all of the concerns and the crises and all of that stuff, it's stuff you don't have to worry about in real life. And I know that sounds like a really obvious thing to say, but it was just, it was just such a kind of release. It was like, it was like being asleep and your dreams taking care vicariously of issues and helping you fix them without having to live through them. It was that same kind of problem solving in a really removed way. <laughs> I, I have to say that I've read an enormous amount of science fiction and have been surprising to me, disappointed with how inadequate I found the visions of the future that I was reading about. They were, I wanted to say, come on, wake up. It could be amazing, and this isn't amazing enough. So I have found science fiction very often very disappointing. I've loved it when people like Sid Mead have been involved designing bits of it, like the first Blade Runner. I mean, that was an incredibly low budget film. But, you know, Sid Mead's police car, that hover car, just looks so totally convincing do you remember that ali g episode where he goes to visit donald trump before any of that political stuff kicked off and he brings in the skateboard without wheels and he's trying to get trump to invest in hoverboards and trump is like well what is it and he's like it's a hoverboard and trump says well how does it work and ali g's like well that's your bit <laughs> <laughs> the science bit this is just my idea <laughs> but um i remember going on this website because um i was doing kind of uh, my exhibition last year i was looking at sort of the transhumanism stuff again and and i was looking up what things in technology and science and technology have come from science fiction films and there's a lot and unfortunately most of it is military military kind of um equipment some of it is things like, you know, flip phones from Star Trek, but a lot of it, like those sort of external soldiers, um, exoskeleton suits and all of these kind of things from films. And it does make you think if we made more films that were more positive and more wonderful rather than constantly just people killing each other, maybe we'd have some more positive technology coming out of it other than you know people getting these brilliant ideas for new ways of uh, protecting or themselves or killing other people because mm. th that was mostly what it was is it was mostly things like um, super soldier kit from things like Terminator was a lot of what was coming out of that and I would say a lot of models for a lot of multinational corporations took a lot from Skynet. <laughs> I reckon a lot of them have modeled themselves on Umbrella Corps and Skynet and those horrible companies that ran the future in those films. Yeah. Yeah, so it makes you wonder like if more science fiction was more kind of, yeah. It's interesting too because Positive. I remember growing up and every new generation of hi-fi was bigger, better, heavier, and more impressive. You know, if people had speakers that were this big, or you needed a crane to get them into your house, it was obviously, they were hugely expensive, but it was also the future. Everything was getting bigger and more impressive. And then suddenly it reversed direction. And, um, you know, now, domestic technology is getting increasingly invisible. Hmm. Imagine 
if you had a high quality cam movie camera in the 70s with a telephone system and a storage system, it would take up a factory. And now it's in your iPhone. So, you know, one, in one direction, technology is disappearing and another, it's still growing. Both are interesting. Mm. Mm. I, uh, I got advertised something on my phone today that I had a dream about last night and that really freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> so I worry a little about these things. And I thought, is that far off from happening? And I thought, well, if you talk in your sleep, no. <laughs> that's definitely something that they're probably doing. Anyway. Our next question is from Kaya Chan. And she says, it's so lovely to listen to you banter again. Thank you, Kaya. I wanted to ask, is there any way, any plan of trying to get your course accredited? I don't know how many people attending are current students, but it would be a wonderful help to those of us who are. To get it accredited? Hmm. Maybe. Not, not, not quickly, but maybe. Hmm. Hmm. I, I have connections with various colleges, which I'm which is still there. I could talk. It's an idea. Hmm. I think that would be exciting. It wouldn't improve the quality of the lessons. It would improve not... the quality of accredited <laughs> art courses generally. Oh. Oh, there you go. There you go. A good deal. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what's involved. I don't know anything about it, in fact. And I, notwithstanding the fact that I have, I have an honorary doctorate, I have a master's degree from the Royal College, and I have a bunch of other qualifications. They're not something I use in everyday life. So I haven't given too much thought to that. So, time I did. Yeah, time, time I did. that mortarboard out and started wafting around in a cape, telling <laughs> people to get back to work. Right. Ah, new insight in who Batman is. <laughs> Oh, we got like, um, we got some kind of nice comments from someone called Keith Nestor. Um, and uh, for some reason, I only screenshot like the central part and the bottom, but he said um, he purchased your book Views when it first came out in the 70s and he still gets inspiration from it today. And he says, and coming from a very poor working class upbringing, could not afford art lessons or art school. My art lessons came from studying my three favorite artists, which you are one. So I thank you again from the deepest parts of my being for your great art and insight of this world. Uh, we live in and what could be. Thank you for answering my question on who owns the rights to your artwork. So that was um, Keith's question. Um, Although uh, you've inspired me from a young man to paint, although I've never made a living with it, drawing and painting have kept me sane in this crazy world. Um, yeah, and he sort of carries on to say, um, now that I'm 63 years old, I'm struggling to find a way to create full time with my music and stained glass art. You're, <laughs> you're my third favorite artist. Um, <laughs> But only after Michelangelo and Da Vinci, so I think that's fair enough. Uh, <laughs> thank you again for spreading and sharing the knowledge and talent with everyone. I suppose I wanted to um, mention his comments for two reasons. I thought that was just really lovely and you probably missed it. But the other thing that he mentioned about art school having been something that he couldn't afford. Well, I have a, an interesting take on that. Hmm. Some of the um, greatest artists I've known really didn't do art school. Um, although they did something else, Patrick Woodruff, for example, whose book, A Closer Look, is one of the books on how, to, how he does his art. 
I thought was good. But he never went to art school. He actually studied German as a language. He was a language student. I think Michael did online courses. Um, a number of artists I know in America did online courses. But a number of others who were really very good. Yeah, they, you'd have to say that's how they learned. They did a bit of copying of people who inspired them, but in the end, they built their own technique and style. And one of the things that's interesting about comic art is that it's an incredibly f um, forced way of working. The delivery rate is phenomenal. So you get good if, you're, if you survive in that world for a couple of years, you have to have done a terrific mileage with the pencil or pen or whatever you choose to do. So a lot of comic artists transcend the medium. And a lot of them didn't do, didn't go to art school, didn't have any fantastic expensive art education. Um, it's a shame. I was going to say it's a shame it's so expensive, but I think it's, I would say differently. It's a shame that by and large, the art schools are not delivering great education anymore. Do you know what I was just thinking of? I was just thinking of my uncle, who's um, our tech person, and he's been sort of involved in the course initially from the point of kind of um, admin and helping us with that but also joined in on the painting and from me never hearing that he's ever lifted a brush um, from the beginning to now where he's done like incredible paintings and not just really really good paintings <laughs> better than people I know who have gone to art school <laughs> Like they are amazing. And I think weirdly, like in some way, because I think he skipped certain steps, it's much more free and spontaneous than someone trying to get everything right from every point. Like he's chucking stuff in there and trying it out. And it's, you can sort of see that there are these like incredible accidents that just keep building <laughs> as well as him being, you know, told, you know, how to do certain things in the formal lessons. Um, but I guess I'm mentioning that because obviously a it can be done that you can learn how to do certain things really quickly um you don't have to do necessarily three or four or five years um in that sort of six week course like incredible things happened um but also i would really like it if at some point we can get to the level where i don't know we can have scholarships and things that mean I, I, slightly different take on it than you, Freya. I think there are things you can teach, and we try and teach those things. But, you know, learning to draw is like learning to play guitar. It starts with a love and a desire to do it. Without that, you don't have the engine. But it does require a great deal of perseverance and time it takes a, a fair bit of time and if you can make that time a very enjoyable process then you're much more likely to stick at it and get there there are shortcuts but in the end you need to put in the time i think i think the other thing about it as well though is if you're talking about education you whenever you talk to anyone about what subjects they enjoyed or didn't enjoy at school it will almost always be because they did or didn't like the teacher <laughs> um well, yeah but i did i i really didn't like when i was at art school my head of department was somebody i was constantly warring with yeah but you were at art school that was i mean you were already invested in going in that direction and that would have affected your experience negatively um, 
I'm not trying to advertise the course, but I guess what I'm saying is, I think if you're going to do art education, it's really important to be in a group and have a tutor who makes the experience something encouraging as well. Yes, and the, sadly, there's some of those, but they're not the majority. I've just remembered something. When we did, when I showed the sketchbook from Canterbury, I said I'd show a couple from Royal College. And I never did. So I do that now because yeah. we've got Gosh. 10 minutes. Yeah. One second. Should I start a conversation by myself or will you be back quickly? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. This probably won't be edited out either because we can't do that kind of thing. So <laughs> it's just you guys and me right now. Um, hmm. <laughs> These are two Royal College sketchbooks. This is They're massive. One. Well, mm, ish, yeah. Have you got scans? Sorry? Have you got scans of the pages? Um. <laughs> Let's have a look. You got to show us. I was doing furniture at the Royal College, so I had to do some bits of furniture. Ah, that looks like a. Is that like a barber's chair? Um, it's a chair that starts sitting up and then drops back down. A recliner. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, what's that? Is that a chair? Um, I think, well, this is a sketchbook I was, everything in this sketchbook was furniture to some degree. There's that same chair again, different page. Mm. So you were working, were you working on separate sheets? or were you already having tracing paper books bound then? That was a book. It so was rebound because it was falling apart. So you used to be able to buy these tracing paper sketchbooks? Detail paper that one was, yeah, yeah. So this is another sketchbook and which I made. Mm. But I was designing all kinds of things, furniture, vehicles, stuff like that. And this became the gun cover, but yeah. it was a, started as a Royal College sketchbook. What did you do that drawing for in the first place? Um, I was showing an idea for a contrast to a domestic interior and wanted something to represent something primeval. Wow, that's amazing. I can see one of those creatures, I saw one of those creatures from that gun cover as well. Uh, yes, they were there. I think people are definitely, wanna, definitely gonna wanna see better images, Dad, and closer up. Okay, but you'll remember this one. Yeah. Okay. Have you got scans of that? Yeah, I have some. Well, we should put that up. Anyway, but what I should say is, thank you very much for that really nice letter. Mm. Actually, thank you everybody for your questions and nice letters. Yeah, it's really nice going through it. Like I've probably said it before, but I follow a lot of podcasters and comedians and some of the experience they have being out in the internet sounds really hairy. And I always feel like so grateful that when I'm going through all these comments and questions, I don't have to be worrying about <laughs> any of that because everyone's so nice. <laughs>
How are we doing? Um, have, we, huh? have we got to the end? Yeah, I think we started at six, right? Or a little bit after. So I think we're pretty much there. Um, how's the house going? Any updates? Did you? Yes. Um, the, the bits are going to be moved by crane. And the crane company is coming to see the prototype, see how it's going to be cut up and to add their comments about whether the pieces are too big or too small. Well, they won't be too small, but they might be too big. And then to see they're going to come here and to figure out how they can actually get the bits craned into where they're going to go. Hmm. Hmm. And what we're hoping is... That's all on Tuesday. Okay. Um... And yeah, and I guess one of the intentions of all of this is that in the future doing these courses, accredited or not, will be from inside the structure and it will, you know, we'll still be doing the filmed. What do you think we'll ever do physical courses in there or are these just going to be filmed? Your lessons just filmed in there. Um, it might be great to do like a workshop now and again. Yeah, I don't see any reason why we couldn't do it in there. Hmm. In that big circular room, I think that would be a nice space for doing workshops. It's not that big. <laughs> it's the bedroom. We'd have to take the bed out. There is no bed in there. Uh, that's true, there isn't. <laughs> so I think it's good to go. <laughs> Somebody's already taken it out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be fun exploring it and walking around it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other business? Anything else to declare? Final thoughts? I apologise to our students, and then we're going to have to do an email, that the certificates and the film have still been worked on. And I'm hoping they'll be done this week. And um, we did do the first films but there were still a couple of technical problems had to be sorted but they should be very quick now okay um, um we have a new calendar coming out and um we have an exhibition in november unless the government closes down everything if um it all goes well um the exhibition at Trading Boundaries, the November exhibition at Trading Boundaries, is at this point going ahead. I have an exhibition in America which has not been confirmed and almost certainly will be postponed from spring to either summer or the following spring. But more on that later when I actually know. Mm. Actually, any, we have any news from you? No, I, I saw a nice comment though on our last Q&A where we'd been talking about the Tokonoma, the Japanese art alcoves and how they yeah. seem like a much more sympathetic place to display and look at art. Um, and someone said that one of the reasons they really enjoyed your exhibition at Trading Boundaries was for that reason, that it wasn't in a big white cube, that you sort of go around and turn corners and there's artwork in amongst sort of elephants and fabrics and, you know, there's, yeah. there, there's these surprises and, you know, these pieces have been placed within the context of, you know, a room, a, a living kind of space. And I thought that was nice and I agree and I think it's and I think what I like about it as well is it makes you be able to experience that artwork as if it were part of a home life situation. Nobody has galleries inside their houses really. Um, no, I, I have a comment on that though and it did make me think about it. Hang on a second to see if I've got it here. Bear with I did an exhibition in the Isle of Man in 2016 and they gave me a, a grid dimension 
Well, so I could make positions where you can see a picture from a distance, you can see a corner and you could go into an alcove and see them really close up. And I was allowed to lay out the space. The other thing they allowed me to do, which was incredible, was to have it painted. And what I wanted was very bright lights on the paintings, but them to be surrounded by a very dark color. As it turned out, it was a very dark blue. And the brightly lit paintings on the dark blue background with those alcoves and vistas choreographing it like that, it was the most successful exhibition I recall ever having done, and I loved it. And what was amazing to me is being in the presence of that many paintings, but you, you couldn't see them all, so you had to explore. And it was complicated enough that you were never sure you'd seen them all. And I liked that. And it was, I frankly could have spent a great deal more time just walking around and looking. I never had that time, sadly. But mm. I loved how it worked out. Anyway, that was me showing off. Well, hopefully, by the next time we do this q and I've got to double check, in the second or third week of October, we'll be doing this talk on the future of art in Japan, which I think with this guy who is talking about um, traditional Japanese ways of looking at art. So I'll put that up if anyone wants to see that as well. I'll put a link somewhere. Because yeah. um, the more people who watch live as well, the more that's great for me. <laughs> can, we put it on, can we put a link on my site too? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. And it would be really nice um, to have as many of you guys joining as possible because you guys okay. are involved too. To the right of the tiger and out of focus, I know what it is. It's a little picture with four heads on it of horses. Ah. Can you get it and show us? Now, these are your paintings, aren't they? Yeah. It's just some horses. When Freya was little, she painted thousands of horses, or drew thousands of horses, and didn't just draw them, but wrote stories for them. From about the age of six onwards, actually from younger, but they weren't so obvious recognizable when she was <laughs> <I'm> rude <laughs> okay all right my love it looks like we've done our time yeah i think so i think so i need a quick word with you about those files i sent so when we stop recording hang on okay um so yeah thank you everybody i hope that was a nice little ramble and you had us on while you were doing something relaxing like cooking or the laundry or something <laughs> that's how i listen to people chat a concise view on things thank you very much and thank you for writing in your questions and yeah keep doing it they're really lovely and it's really nice because often you ask questions about things that i don't know about either so it's good for me to sadly you ask questions that i don't know about <laughs> well Anyway, I love I love hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you everybody. See you next week. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>